Mexico, a country located just south of the United States, has long been a hotspot for tourists eager to experience its beach resorts, cultural festivals, vibrant restaurant scenes, and warm weather. While it's clear that visitors can have plenty of fun in this lively country, the bustling crowds also make it a prime location for sinister activities, sometimes resulting in tourists vanishing without a trace. Prepare to be spooked as we check out these five baffling stories. On May 1, 2022, 32-year-old Tani Shank, her husband Jorge Luis Aguirre Astudillo, and their daughter Adeline traveled from their home in Merida to the tourist hotspot of Cancun for what seemed to be a vacation. Upon their arrival, they checked into a hotel, but left the very next day for Merida, as seen by CCTV footage at the hotel. It is believed that the car only traveled approximately 20 kilometers before a U-turn was made in a direction that headed back towards Cancun. Shortly afterwards, the vehicle took a detour off the highway. It remains unclear where the couple were heading, but this occurred around the same time the last phone signal from their car was detected. As night approached later that day, Adeline was found barefoot outside the Parroquia San Miguel Archangel Church, one of the largest churches in the city. From all indications, it appeared that she had been abandoned by someone. A witness who was inside the church with family later confirmed that a stranger had approached him about the little girl and mentioned that he would look for her parents. However, the stranger never returned despite the witness waiting for a while. Initially, it seemed to be a case of a lost child after the witness called the police to report finding Adeline outside the church. Authorities quickly responded by issuing an alert to locate the child's parents and shared photos of Adeline on social media to ensure that the information went far. This led to Tani's brother finding a Facebook post about his niece wandering alone near a church. Immediately, Tani's family called the authorities, revealing that they were related to the child in the alert. Simultaneously, it became apparent that Tani and her husband were missing, as the family also revealed they had been unable to contact them. While Adeline was later released from a refuge for orphaned children into her family's custody, the disappearance of Tani and Horge led authorities to issue missing person alerts for the couple within days of each other. Within weeks, it turned into a full-blown investigation, especially after a car that seemingly belonged to the couple was found to have been burnt out in Puerto Morelos, about 40 kilometers south of Cancun. As expected, rumors about what led to the disappearance also began to swirl, with the most disturbing theory alleging domestic violence. This theory centered on Horge, with many suspecting that he had killed Tani and then vanished to avoid arrest. Adding weight to this speculation was a text message Tani had sent to a friend before going missing. In the message, Tani instructed her friend to remember her husband's name in case anything happens to her, implying a fear of Horge. Furthermore, earlier texts exchanged between Tani and the same friend revealed a troubled relationship between Tani and Horge. The messages indicated that she was planning to escape the marriage and return to her family home with Adeline, without Jorge's knowledge. Months later, the case took a sharp turn when a new theory emerged after a lead indicated the missing couple might have been killed in a remote jungle area near a housing complex in southern Cancun. The lead linked Horish to criminal activity involving Mexico's dangerous drug cartels, suggesting the disappearance was a form of retaliation for an act that he committed. At the time, the authorities, who were determined to find answers, launched a search party scouring several acres of the jungle around the area, analyzed from the lead. Cadaver dogs were also deployed in the search to help find unmarked graves where the couple's bodies might have been hidden if they were murdered. Amid the investigation, Tani's family weren't keeping their hands folded. They offered a substantial reward of $70,000 for any information that could lead them to find her. Additionally, they hired a private investigator to explore any fresh leads that might have been missed. Even more shocking, they consulted specialists who could potentially help retrieve any relevant information from Adeline, who was nearly three years old at the time. However, all the efforts proved fruitless in the end, leaving the mystery of Tani and Jorge's disappearance even more baffling. Elijah Snow and his wife, Jamie Lynn Snow, plan to celebrate their 10th wedding anniversary by traveling to Mexico. To make the process easier, they arranged their trip through the Texas-based travel group, Let's Go On Vacay LLC. On July 18, 2021, they arrived in Cancun and checked into the Royalton Chic Cancun, where their travel agent had booked rooms for them. After unpacking and settling in, Elijah and Jamie Lynn headed to the pool in the Diamond Club area and began enjoying the unlimited alcoholic drinks and socializing with fellow guests. The day continued with drinks by the pool, punctuated only by a break for dinner. By early evening, Jamie felt the effects of the long travel day and the alcohol catching up with her. Deciding it was time to sleep it off, she informed Elijah that she was heading back to their room. However, Elijah wasn't ready to follow her as he was yet to be done with his drink. 
He then responded that he would head up once he was through. By 3.30 a.m. the next morning, Jamie woke up and found the other side of the bed undisturbed. Panic surged through her as she realized Elijah hadn't returned. Frantically, she began searching the room and hotel for any sign of him. Two hours of searching yielded nothing, and Jamie knew she couldn't wait any longer. She contacted the hotel staff, who were uninterested in helping her immediately, and told her to go back to her room and wait to see if her husband would turn up by himself. Around 10 a.m., Jamie was escorted to a private area to make a call to the police. Shortly after, she was taken to a nearby police station. There, officers delivered shocking news. Elijah had been found after falling through a window at an open-air theater located right next to the Royalton Chic Cancun. Later, Jamie was brought to another station for identification purposes. However, she was only allowed to view her husband's body through a monitor, not in person. She was also informed that his death was classified as a murder without suspect. Unconvinced by the explanation, Jamie insisted on seeing evidence from the scene. She was then allowed to make duplicates with her phone after she had paid several hundred dollars. The pictures revealed that Elijah had bruising on the front and back of his head, alongside multiple injuries on his back and legs. He also had scratches and bruises on his forehead, cheeks, hands, and arms. Additionally, his face was covered with dirt and mud, as if he had been dragged while several hundred dollars were missing from his wallet. For Jamie, the evidence made it more evident that her husband's death was no accident. She believed he was kidnapped, robbed, and killed, prompting her to file a lawsuit against the travel agency and other third parties involved in their travel arrangements. In her suit, she alleged that they were responsible for Elijah's death, accusing them of misleading them about the safety of the area. Specifically, she claimed they were informed that Cancun was safer than places like Paris, France, and Las Vegas, Nevada. Reports later revealed that Elijah had gone up to the hotel room a few minutes after his wife had left him. However, when he pressed the elevator call button, it didn't immediately open to allow him in. In his intoxicated state, he then walked to the opposite end of the elevator bank and began ascending a circular stairwell inside the front of the hotel, an area that the hotel claimed had faulty cameras. It marked the last time he was seen alive, as no footage of him going to the lobby or leaving the hotel was ever found. His body was later cremated according to the wishes of his family, while a GoFundMe was started to assist Jamie and his two young daughters. Monica Burgos Beresford Redmond and Bruce Beresford Redmond's marriage was on the brink of collapse due to infidelity issues. Despite this, they decided to make an effort to rekindle their love by taking a trip to Cancun. In early April 2010, they traveled to the Mexican city with their children. However, just a few days after their arrival, Bruce reported that his wife was missing, stating that she had left their hotel to go shopping and had not returned. As the husband of the missing person, Bruce quickly became a prime suspect in her disappearance. Suspicion intensified when Monica's body was discovered in a sewer at the resort where they were staying, bearing strangulation marks on her neck. Upon interviewing Bruce, authorities noticed scratch marks on his neck, which they suspected were inflicted during a struggle with his wife. Additionally, hotel staff reported seeing the couple quarrel violently, and several guests told police they heard arguing coming from the couple's room. In light of these reports and the marks on Bruce's neck, he was asked not to leave the country while further investigations were carried out. To ensure compliance, authorities seized his passport and had his children flown back to the United States to be placed in the custody of their grandparents. Instead of complying, Bruce returned to the U.S. by crossing the border via road using an alternate form of identification. He was not stopped because only U.S. citizens traveling by air across the border are required to present their passports for identification. By this time, Mexican authorities had become increasingly convinced that Bruce was responsible. A forensic expert had already discovered traces of blood on sheets left in the room where Bruce and Monica had stayed. Similar traces were found on a pillar in the balcony railing. Investigators also noted that the room where the couple had stayed overlooked the sewage tank where Monica's body was discovered. Furthermore, Analysis of a key card from the room indicated it had been used multiple times on the night of the murder. At the end of the investigation, it was concluded that Bruce had struck his wife in the head with a metal tube, bat, or stick, and then choked her to death before disposing of her body in a hotel sewer. This conclusion was supported by the autopsy report, which determined that Monica died of asphyxia by suffocation and identified bruising on her face along with a head wound. Since Bruce was already in the United States, he could only face charges for his wife's death if extradited. Therefore, Mexican authorities initiated extradition proceedings with the United States to facilitate this process. Monica's family had hoped that the extradition process would proceed swiftly. However, Bruce hired expert lawyers to stop it from happening. After a nearly two-year-long court battle, he was finally extradited to Mexico to face a murder charge. 
Throughout the court proceedings, Bruce maintained his innocence, despite additional evidence showing that he had taken out two life insurance policies in Monica's name just weeks before her death. He was later sentenced to 12 years in prison, which prosecutors felt was too light, but never pursued an appeal. Due to Mexican laws making prisoners eligible for release after serving 60% of a sentence, Bruce was released after serving seven and a half years with credit for good behavior. He then returned to his home in Southern California where he continues to live, although he never regained custody of his children. Dean Lucas and Adam Coleman, lifelong friends in their 30s, shared a passion for surfing that had taken them on many adventures together. In November 2015, they embarked on a road trip to Mexico, planning to chase epic waves and revisit some favorite spots. Adam, in particular, was looking forward to reuniting with Andrea Gomez, a university student from Guadalajara he'd met on a previous trip. After driving for miles past several Canadian and American cities, the duo arrived in Baja, where they spent a week riding the waves. Their plan was to then take a ferry across the Gulf of California, the 140-mile wide bay that separates the Baja California Peninsula from the Mexican mainland in Sinaloa, and drive south to Guadalajara to meet up with Andrea. Knowing they had a long drive ahead to meet Andrea in Guadalajara, Dean and Adam hoped to catch the ferry across the Gulf of California quickly. Unfortunately, a two-hour delay pushed their arrival on the mainland close to midnight. Arriving late did not bother the duo. They had spent the last decade visiting multiple countries and knew how to handle themselves in foreign lands. However, unbeknownst to them, the stretch of road from the mainland to Guadalajara, known as the Benito Juarez Toll Road, was a hotspot for night bandits and had even earned the moniker the Highway of Death. Thirty minutes after leaving the ferry harbor, Dean and Adam's Chevy van pulled into a convenience store called Los Mocos. They asked the lone gas attendant on duty that night for directions and got a map before hitting the road to continue their journey. Two hours later, a security camera captured their van passing through a toll booth at Las Brisas, 50 miles away. But at 10.30 a.m. the next day, a Chevrolet van identical to the one driven by Dean and Adam was found burnt out in farmland at Navalado, about 200 kilometers south of the toll booth. Inside the van were two bodies so badly burnt that Mexican authorities could not immediately identify them. When news of the incident spread on social media, Andrea and Dean's girlfriend Josie Cox, who had been worried after not hearing from their partners, reached out to the police about the possibility of the burnt bodies being those of their boyfriends. Andrea then visited authorities with one of Adam's dreadlocks, which he had previously given her, to be tested for DNA, while Cox traveled to the country with Dean's dental records. After the autopsy, their worst fears were confirmed. The bodies were indeed those of their boyfriends. The investigation by Mexican authorities led to the capture of three suspects and the recovery of the alleged getaway car, a Jeep Cherokee, and the murder weapon, a .357 Magnum revolver. Authorities also obtained signed confessions from all three suspects in custody. The confessions revealed that they had intercepted Dean and Adam's van, shot Adam in the face when he tried to resist, killed Dean, and then drove the vehicle to another location where they set it on fire. However, almost immediately after the arrests were announced, the case against the men began to fall apart. The family members of one suspect filed a complaint with the Sinaloa State Commission on Human Rights, claiming that authorities had forced the confessions through beatings and death threats. Ultimately, the true identities of Dean and Adam's killers may never be known. On December 22, 2022, Jose Gutierrez from Hamilton, Ohio, traveled to Zacatecas, Mexico with his family. His purpose was to meet his girlfriend, Daniela Pichardo, whom he was soon to marry. Three days after their arrival, Jose, two female family members, and Daniela headed out together to have some fun. They were expected to return home around 10 p.m. local time, but they did not arrive back as planned. When family members tried to reach Jose and the others, they received no reply. However, Daniela's mother had last received a message from her daughter showing her location to be 20 miles away from their town. They headed out to the location they had gotten from Daniela, but upon their arrival, they were not allowed to enter the area by police authorities, who claimed the area was dangerous. Given the information, family members feared that their loved ones had been kidnapped, but held on to hope that this was not the case, and that they would soon be found. Days later, their hope was dashed when they saw multiple media reports on social media indicating a kidnapping incident at a local restaurant called Solana Resto Bar, located about 30 minutes from Daniela's house. Surveillance footage from the restaurant revealed that Jose and the group arrived at the bar and spent nearly two hours there before leaving around 6.08 p.m. Eyewitness reports then confirmed that several unknown individuals kidnapped the group in their vehicle outside of the restaurant. 
Prior to the discovery, police authorities had launched an investigation into finding the missing group after Jose and Daniela's families reported their disappearance. The information about the restaurant incident then helped narrow the scope of their search. Within days, the vehicle in which the group was kidnapped was found abandoned in Vivoras, a location very close to where Daniela's location message to her mother had originated. The van showed signs of being riddled with over a dozen bullets, and its tires were blown out. Further investigations led authorities to discover four bodies, one male and three female, buried in an unmarked grave near where the car was found. Upon seeing the bodies in that male-female ratio and identifying the vehicle, police authorities were convinced that they belonged to the missing group. Autopsy reports later confirmed this identification. Despite ongoing investigations, no suspects have been arrested in connection with their murders to date.